Uh, first of all, I'm going to give you an instruction, uh, introduction, and then I'm going to take you through bits of the uh, document, with the Mead document, uh, to introduce you to parts of it. I can't uh, give you all the information, it's about 180 pages, um, so I'm just inviting you to have a look at it. Um, but I, I'm going to introduce you to what you'll find when you, when you have a look in there. Okay, let's kick off then. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, problem that we're um, trying to address. Um, this is um, a young woman, Avril Hart, um, who's been uh, very extensively documented, whose, whose progress and sad death has been very, very um, uh, um, comprehensively documented. In, and you can see the investigations that uh, were done in her case on the right, bottom right. Uh, there were two mental health trust investigations. There was an acute trust, in other words, the medical unit did an investigation, the medical trust. The university did an investigation because she was at uh, university at the time. Um, and uh, there was subsequently, partly as, as a result of the pressure um, uh, and the campaign really by, the, by Avril's father, um, a, a report uh, by the Ombudsman, which was extremely important. And then um, another coroner's report because the case was reopened um, and a further coroner's report was, uh, was issued. So extensive uh, documentation, so we know exactly uh, what um, the um, inv investigations found. And I've just uh, picked out one aspect of it, which was the fact that uh, she admitted to a medical ward with a very low BMI, 10.8, um, and uh, the glucose level was low. Um, she wasn't fed for four days while abnormal um, was investigated. She was then transferred to another medical ward where the, low, where the blood sugar was even lower, uh, less than two um, uh, millimoles per litre. Um, uh, this was unfortunately left untreated uh, because it was thought that it was the machine was at fault and not the fact that her glucose was so low and she died in hypoglycemic coma. Um, there are a number of lessons from this and we, we do um, address this in Mead. You, you can have a look at the different areas but first of all if you suspect an eating disorder, and there was no doubt that she had an eating disorder, she'd been in treatment for over a year um, for her eating disorder, so uh, diagnosis was not in doubt. Uh, so um, if you see um, malnutrition uh, due to uh, a severe eating disorder, you have to feed the patient immediately, and any other investigations need to, uh, need to be done in parallel, not uh, sequentially, uh, not uh, before. Um, in any case, liver enzymes are often raised in severe anorexia nervosa because the body is doing its best to um, get um, calories and nutrition from anywhere it can, including the liver, and that damages the liver and uh, you get raised enzymes in the blood. Um, Hyperglycemia is quite complex in uh, severe anorexia nervosa because um, the patient can, can, can be... Um, completely alert and, and appear completely fine, um, even though they have an extremely low blood sugar. And the reason for this is that by the time uh, the uh, blood sugar is low, all the glycogen in the body, which is the uh, uh, chemical which um, supplies um, uh, glucose to the cells, that's all gone. Um, uh, and um, what, the, what you are surviving on is um, metabolism of fat. Now, fat produces something called ketone bodies, and ketone bodies are able to be used by the heart and the brain. And this is why someone with an extremely low blood sugar, which if it was caused by another uh, uh, reason, such as, um, uh, for example, an overuse of insulin, uh, the patient would be unconscious. But in this situation with anorexia nervosa, the ketones are keeping you going um, and um, uh, you can still have a very low blood sugar and also appear okay. Um, however, there's a lot of that because uh, there's a limited amount of fat in the body. And when that gives out, that's when the patient uh, 
I think that's when the patient dies. We don't know exactly. Anyway, a hypoglycemia does need to be treated as an emergency. Um, the best treatment in general is food. Um, although in this situation with severe hypoglycemia and uh, especially if it's symptomatic, if the patient is uh, drowsy or whatever, um, they probably need an injection of, um, of uh, glucose, of high, high potency glucose. So lots of lessons from that case. Um, this all started, it was called Marzipan originally, which stands for Management of Really Sick Patients with Anorexia Nervosa. And um, I was asked to um, appear on stage at the Baypen conference in 2008. Baypen is the British Association for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. And um, a physician presented this uh, case, which was very similar to Avril, um, who was admitted um, after having been in a, an eating disorder service and they were unable to treat her because she was so ill. And so she went into a, a gastro ward um, and they were unable to get on top of her eating disorder because she was sabotaging her um, treatment um, uh, because uh, she was terrified of weight gain. Uh, the family were in, in, uh, in disarray um, arguing with each other and um, all sorts of problems between the, the family and the, um, and the team. And unfortunately, the patient slipped through the net uh, that was allowed um, and um, ended up dying um, on, the, um, on the medical ward uh, at the age of, uh, I think, 17. So I was, um, I, mean, I did comment on it, um, I, but I was really uh, outraged by the fact that this could happen in, uh, in, in this day and age, in the 21st century. And so I got together with the physician who presented the case, um, who was uh, very affected by it and upset by it. Um, and we got together a group of physicians and psychiatrists, and we also had dietitian. Um, and um, uh, carers um, involved in the original write-up. Um, and we wrote a, um, a document called Marzipan, um, which uh, wanted, which we, the, the aim of which was to um, give advice to people like uh, physicians and GPs and um, uh, people in um, what was then called A&E, um, to, and how to deal with somebody with anorexia nervosa um, uh, who is extremely underweight and who can't be ad admitted to a psychiatric ward because they are too ill uh, but, and so ends up in a medical ward where the staff don't know how to treat her or him for that matter. So that was the aim. Um, uh, a young person's version for under 18s is slightly different um, uh, priorities actually in the younger version came out in 2012 called Junior Marzipan and we reviewed the revised the uh, original Marzipan in 2014 and then um, some years later I was asked to um, consider um, a further revision and so um, we produced what ended up as MEAD medical emergencies in eating disorders and this was no, no, launched on the 19th of May this year, and uh, that's going to form the bulk of this um, presentation. Okay, the current issues about marzipans, um, there's certainly um, more awareness of eating disorders among clinicians, especially psychiatrists and pediatricians. Um, there has also been more awareness in adult um, medical physicians, um, although uh, I would say that the result, the response there has been um, less than in the other groups and uh, sometimes been quite disappointing. But nevertheless, there has been activity. And um, when we were producing Mead, um, we had tremendous support from the emergency medicine and the gastroenterology, especially nutrition group. Um, so um, this is... Um, been a real change and uh, it's been very robust and um, for that reason we're hoping for a change in in uptake and, uh, and that there'll be fewer cases because there still are cases unfortunately like this. 
So, as I said, uh, fatal cases continue to be reported from the medical units well after publication of marzipan. To tell the truth, they're also reported from psychiatric units and also from GP um, um, uh, uh, locations. Um, so the problem is everywhere. The, the fact that anorexia, anorexia nervosa and other eating disorders, they're relatively um, uncommon. Um, the severe cases, let's say, um, and so people don't have much experience of dealing with them. Um, and so um, also they're, they're really not taught well in medical schools up to this point. Um, and so um, that's where the, uh, the problem uh, really begins. And um, just in the last year, there's been concern from a coroner about uh, eating disorder deaths. And so we wanted to make the guidance, the new MEAD, um, relevant to all royal colleges so that they would be accepted by them. And uh, there was a call for an all age document, and this is basically what we did. So first of all, there was a leadership group, the project group. This was um, myself, Dasha Nichols from Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist and Agnes Hayton, the chair of the uh, college eating disorder faculty. And we uh, worked together with um, the NCCMH, which is the National Collaborating Centre for Mental Health. Um, uh, who, who were commissioned by the Royal College of Psychiatrists and we're very grateful for that. Um, the NCCMH used to write NICE, the Mental Health NICE, they don't anymore, but they're an extremely competent group and they kept us uh, to task. And um, but although we um, were the main um, writers of the, um, of the sort of how, how everyone contributed. And then outside that group, we had a, a quite a large expert reference group, which was 16 members from the Royal Colleges of Medicine, Pediatrics, Psychiatry and Emergency Medicine, as well as um, dietitians and two experts by experience of an eating disorder and one carer. So um, just back to the project group, uh, this was the NCCMH. They conducted systematic reviews and uh, we all together wrote a, a draft document. Um, uh, they also liaised with the Royal Colleges to make sure that we were complying with their uh, required procedures for official guidelines. We wanted this to be completely accepted as an official guideline, a bit like NICE is, uh, is almost always accepted. So then we sent it to the ERG to review and they had lots of comments and we discussed things with them. We had meetings with the ERG, the, that's the expert reference group, and um, made the various uh, changes they suggested. Um, and then eventually we got to a draft document which was circulated to a larger stakeholder group, which was of 29 organizations, including charities such as BEAT and FEAST and medical groups, um, uh, including the, the Royal Colleges um, and also uh, the British Dietetic Association um, also, and the British Psychological Society, all sorts of relevant groups um, um, made, made comments and they did make comments and um, uh, I'm really pleased they did uh, and they, were, they really have improved the document. Um, and um, uh, only organizations were able to register as um, stakeholder groups, uh, but as you see, a large number did. And I think most people who needed to be giving uh, us information were able to. So just uh, what, um, what happened to produce Mead, first of all, the name, uh, the experts, uh, their experience, and several professional groups didn't like the name marzipan. They found it belittling and too anorexia focused. It certainly is anorexia focused. And so there was a strong opinion favoring change. And um, we avoided a complex acronym and went for a, a, the brief mead, um, which is uh, where it stays. 
we combined marzipan and junior marzipan to create an all age guidance. Um, and lastly, the diagnosis, we extended the guidance to all eating disorders because any eating disorder can be, uh, can be dangerous. Much of the content um, um, is similar to marzipan, which uh, if you've read that, you'll, you'll notice uh, similarities. But there are important differences. Uh, there's an all, it's an all age document now. It has a new traffic light RAF, which is risk assessment framework. It's with three traffic lights, uh, as opposed to four in the junior marzipan. We reduced the number to the usual number of three traffic lights. Um, there are literacy reviews and guideline comparisons within there. Um, and there are summary sheets, one for each constituency, including one for each uh, emergency department staff and also for um, uh, patients and or rather experts by experience or sufferers and also their supporters or, or their families. And there's a brand new section on type 1 diabetes and eating disorders now known as TIDE, um, rather than a bulimia, sorry, um, um, diabulimia, which um, has now, now mo mostly been dropped in favour of TIDE, which I think is a, a great move. So first of all, the, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to end this bit of the talk, uh, but with some summary and conclusions. So treatment of eating disorders in non-specialist settings can be very challenging. And collaboration between psychiatric, which is either eating disorder or liaison, but occasionally community psychiatric, uh, general psychiatric services and medical services is essential to avoid more deaths. So working together is the, uh, probably the key thing that we, we want to promote. This new guidance offered, offers advice for clinicians with younger and older patients, and it has a traffic light system that you, sh you should be used as part of a competent clinical evaluation. It's not a tick box exercise purely. And we hope that the Royal Colleges will accept our work as official guidelines. And that hasn't happened ind individually with each of the Royal Colleges, although the Royal College of, uh, importantly, um, Charles, uh, uh, paediatrics and um, uh, child um, health have um, accepted the, the guidelines and also have the um, Academy of Royal Colleges, which is an overall body covering all Royal Colleges. So we're doing well from that point of view. And we hope that our new guideline will be used to avoid the unacceptable deaths that continue to occur amongst our patients. So you can join the discussion. There's um, marzipan, send an email to marzipan and mead request at gisquail.com or just write to me at UCL. So part two of this talk um, is um, more detailed. And um, here we go um, into assessment and treatment of adults with eating disorders in the, in the emergency department. Um, uh, but it, it applies to uh, medical wards and also to primary care. <clears throat> this is, I'm talking primarily about adults because that's my main area of clinical expertise. Um, and um, uh, there will be other um, talks uh, given about um, management of children, although I might have a few comments to make about that. As I said, Mead is endorsed by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, and there's their logo. So the first question that one needs to ask oneself is faced with an eating disorder patient, say in the emergency department or in primary care, is how ill is the patient? First of all, bear in mind that eating disorders have the highest standardized mortality of any mental illness and that includes schizophrenia and uh, depression, both of which have high rates of, um, of mortality. Uh, the reason that eating disorders have the highest standardized mortality is that patients with eating disorders who die tend to be young. And so when you standardize for age, uh, that increases above the other uh, disorders. 
So have a look at the risk assessment framework, which is table one in Mead. Have a look at the Mead checklist, um, which is in the appendices in, in Mead. Um, and that so uh, gives you an idea of um, what questions to ask yourself when you when you're faced with someone with an eating disorder. And um, we're developing an app for Mead. You'll be pleased to know uh, it's not out yet, but uh, we're commissioning it. Uh, we've got funding for it, and um, we hope by let's say um, middle of uh, 2023. Uh, the app should be um, designed and created and av available. This is the checklist uh, which you'll find on the website of the Royal College of Psychiatrists but also um, as part of the Mead document. It has three bits, assessment, refeeding and management and uh, for example does the patient have an eating disorder? Yes or no? If not, if you're not sure what to do, request a psychiatric review. So it's got um, uh, uh, questions to ask yourself in all areas that we think are relevant. So um, uh, use this if you're someone who's on the front line, um, or indeed if you're, say, a therapist who's um, faced with someone with, an, with a severe eating disorder, um, you might want to use this to think um, about um, whether this person um, should um, be uh, medically reviewed or even admitted to hospital, all those, all those things. So don't say you can't, because you're not medical, you can't separate yourself from this because you will be um, um, held responsible if um, someone comes to your, comes to a therapy session and then leaves and then comes to grief afterwards, partly held so first of all the traffic light framework um, uh, it's the risk assessment framework the RAF um, it's all age so traffic light red amber and green um, and these are the areas to assess weight BMI and rate of change of BMI cardiovascular including pulse BP and electrocardiogram uh, temperature and hydration biochemistry and hematology, muscle strength, eating disorder behavior symptoms, such as engagement with the treatment, um, exercise and purging, self-harm and suicide. So any, any red risk on the RAF um, needs overall clinical evaluation. So if someone has a red risk anywhere, they have a low BMI, um, they have, um, they're losing weight quickly, they have a low temperature, any of these things, make sure that there's a full medical um, evaluation to make sure so that um, the patient is uh, properly uh, assessed for their, um, their risk. And as I said, we are commissioning an app and we have got funding and uh, it'll be in due course. I know not early enough for everybody. So just uh, talking about weight and BMI, um, you'll know that the WHO normal, WHO normal range for BMI is 18.5 to 25. So look at the absolute level. If it's less than 13, that's a red risk. If it's 13 to 15, that's a amber risk. And if it's more than 15, that's a green risk. You'll notice that it's not normal, the over 15. It's still underweight and you can still have severe anorexia nervosa uh, at 15. But um, you're not um, uh, at high risk of collapsing and needing, needing admission to hospital. That's what it means. It doesn't mean there's no, no risk. There's lots of risk. So look at the rate of change as well. Um, is it more than one kilogram a week? Is it 0.5 to one kilogram a week? Or is it less than 0.5 kilogram a week? Which gives you the different risk ratings. You'll notice that... Um, uh, the risks are not absolute. It's not really like a traffic light in that you really can't st not stop at a traffic light when you're driving. Whereas if someone has a BMI over, uh, under 13, say someone has a BMI of 12.5, on this rating they'd have a, a high a red medical risk, uh, and be mead risk. But um, if they've had a, a BMI of 12.5 for the last 15 years 
and uh, uh, continue to work and have a family life and uh, uh, do other things that they want to do, then uh, clearly they're not at high risk of collapsing because they've proven that. Um, so have a look at the rate of change and the other things uh, which might actually put them into a high risk level. Um, so the other thing to mention is that uh, whatever weight the patient is, even if they're not underweight, uh, losing more than a kilogram a week, um, even if you're obese, can be a high risk. I know that uh, some patients who are on very low calorie diets will be losing at that rate, but they can get into medical trouble and, um, and so they should be uh, risk assessed if that's happening. Now, um, be aware that, and I'm sure you are aware that people, patients may falsify their weight, but for example, drinking water, a lot of water uh, before being weighed. So the answer to that is, um, is to use other measures uh, uh, to assess their nutritional state, as well as BMI. Don't, don't neglect BMI, but use these others. First one is cardiovascular health. A pulse rate of less than 40 is worrying. A blood pressure of less than 90 systolic. That's the, if, uh, if the blood pressure is 90 over 60, say, uh, the, the top figure, 90, is the systolic. Um, so if they have a, a low um, blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, if they have a, a large drop in blood pressure when they stand up, uh, of more than 20 milligrams of mercury, that's, uh, that's significant as well. The ECG, you can see all sorts of abnormalities. That, there I've, got, I've given you an example of a patient who in the top um, ECG has an inverted T wave, that's the right hand wave, which should be upright and it's, on, it's below the surface. And um, after two days of refeeding, uh, look what happens to the T wave. Uh, it becomes normal and upright. And also you can see that the heart rate has increased as well. The temperature at less than 35 degrees auxiliary, um, the hydration, which is acute fluid refusal or signs of dehydration, um, uh, which um, you need to take account of. Some of these are things which would only be um, uh, clear when you're uh, doing a medical examination and also doing some investigations. So muscle strength testing, this is quite important and quite an important thing to do, um, especially if you're not sure that someone is um, uh, giving you an accurate weight. So there's the SUS test, which is, um, I don't know if I'm stuck in, in the way, in your view, there are, get me out of the way. Um, uh, the the left-hand one is where you lie the patient flat on the floor um, and sit them up. They sit up and then lie, lie down flat again. And the other one is they're standing up, they squat, and they stand up again. Um, there's a, um, a scale um, which you can find in, um, in Mead and also a YouTube um, uh, demonstration of how to do this test. Um, which you'll find on that, on that uh, YouTube address. Um, it happens to be my daughter who um, is, doesn't have an eating disorder, I'm very pleased to say, uh, but um, has uh, demonstrated this test very expertly. The second one we use is the hand grip strength. Uh, you have to buy something for this. Um, and I must say that one there, which is the one I got, I got from Amazon, it wasn't that expensive. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a good measure uh, for, but partly because patients quite like doing it, they don't mind doing it, um, whereas they're not that keen on the squat sus test. Um, and um, if you're doing it every day and it's going down, uh, whereas the weight is staying the same or increasing, then that's um, evidence that um, the weight might be falsified. The third one you can do, you can choose which one you want to do. Um, is the mid upper arm circumference so widely used in dietetics um, and um, uh, you find the uh, point of the shoulder and the point of the elbow measure between and take the, the halfway point and take the circumference of the muscle the biceps muscle at that point and less than 18 is thought to be um, a um, 
a highly significant level. Then there are psychological and behavioral aspects. Um, engagement, for example, a patient who's resistant to any treatment which involves weight gain is at high risk and they might be struggling with parents or with staff, physically struggling. Um, eating behavior, acute food, food refusal, for example, less than 500 calories a day for two or more days, that increases the risk. Frequent and extreme exercise, frequent and vomiting, frequent laxative abuse, they all increase the uh, risk. And then there are um, the, the, the predictors of suicide, such as suicidal thoughts, suicidal plans, and self-harming behavior, all um, have an increased risk of uh, completed suicide. And remember that um, in patients with anorexia nervosa who die, one in five die from suicide. Now here's for uh, people who are interested in biochemistry and hematology. Uh, the hyperkalemia, which is low potassium level, is probably the most dangerous change. Um, uh, less than 3.5 is abnormal, and so you should make sure you repeat that. And less than three, you should consider admission. Um, if you uh, treat them in the emergency department, make sure the patient is reviewed and blood taken within two to four days. Um, if you um, see them in any and treat them with uh, intravenous um, potassium and discharge them because the potassium is normal, make sure they're reviewed and uh, the blood taken, uh, the blood is reviewed in within two to four days. And make sure there's follow up by an eating disorders clinician. Hypoglycemia, which I, I mentioned before, the patient may be conscious because of ketones, as I said. Um, abnormal liver function, which is normal in starvation and just needs to be monitored, only if it uh, goes out of control and uh, suggests the possibility of liver failure, which can happen, but it's very rare um, should you um, do any more investigations. The other electrolytes, um, low, low sodium often means water loading. Um, which uh, sometimes can present with status epilepticus. In other words, patient um, it water loads more and more, and eventually um, uh, the sodium goes so low um, that the patient has a fit, and that's what brings them into hospital. Low bicarbonate, this is due to alkalosis. Alkali, alkal, the, uh, the body becomes alkaline due to the loss of acid from the stomach or due to vomiting. Often there's a low potassium. There's a low magnesium in laxative abuse and also can happen in the refeeding syndrome and low phosphate, which occurs in the refeeding syndrome. In the refeeding syndrome, as somebody who's been starving for a considerable time and suddenly gets um, a whole lot of um, carbohydrate and the cells suddenly start um, um, getting energized by the, by the glucose that's uh, around now. And they, uh, they very quickly uh, suck in uh, magnesium and phosphate and potassium, which can lead to uh, low levels of magnesium, phosphate and potassium in the blood, which can be fatal. And then there's hematology. Um, in severe anorexia, you can get um, marrow, bone marrow failure with anemia, a petechiae, that's um, small hemorrhages in the skin due to low platelets, and leukopenia, which is low white cells. And that's called pancytopenia, which means all the cells are reduced. Okay, um, I'm going to show you in Mead some of the ways that uh, the information is presented. And these are snippets only, just a taste. So first of all, um, there's um, something that we, we've called box one, which is one of the... Uh, one of the tables, one of the boxes in, in Mead, and which are potential challenges to accurate risk assessment. First of all, the patient, the patient can appear well, and don't take that as reassuring, they often do. Because of the drive to exercise, they may be active up to the point of collapse, um, as that um, patient, or rather that person, that woman who's uh, running um, when she's obviously very underweight. Um, suicidal ideation and behavior are common. 
bloods are off, often normal and that's not necessarily reassuring. We've had so many patients who've been discharged from hospital because their bloods were normal, but um, they've sub subsequently died uh, from, uh, say, low blood pressure or, or um, cardiac um, arrhythmias, all sorts of problems. And also just to say, don't reassure the patient that their risk is low because you can provoke um, increased restriction and vomiting and exercise in someone who is uh, desperate uh, to be um, thinner and thinner. And they know that, um, uh, that a low risk means that they're, uh, in their mind, they feel too fat. So the, the other thing is that uh, fear of weight restoration can reduce the patient's ability to give an accurate account of their history. In other words, they might underplay certain aspects uh, because they're worried about being admitted to hospital and uh, possibly made to gain weight. So this is the risk assessment framework. You can see the red, amber and green. And just as an example is weight loss, recent loss of weight of more than one kilogram a week for two consecutive weeks. Recent loss of weight of 0.5 to one kilogram a week for two consecutive weeks recent weight loss of more than, sorry, less than half a kilogram a week. So there we are. I'm, uh, I won't go through everything that I'm presenting, uh, showing you here. This is um, table two, which is um, how to manage the um, abnormal findings. So for example, if you find a low heart rate, um, if you, or you measure the heart rate, look for a low heart rate, look for, um, um, increase in heart rate when the patient stands up um, uh, and uh, it tells you when to be concerned and it tells you how to manage that situation. So we hope that will be helpful. And light bulb signs we've given, um, here's the checklist of light bulb signs. I mean, this is only one of them. Uh, so rapid weight loss, more than one kilogram a week for two consecutive weeks, that's an absolute um, a light bulb sign, which uh, you've got, to, you should be taking um, notice of. So psychological symptoms, body image disturbance, anxiety and depression. Um, so especially um, self-harm and um, suicidal ideas. So we've got a, a table which uh, gives you an idea of which sort of um, you know you should be referring the patient to. Say you're in A&E or you're in um, primary care. Um, should you refer to a, a specialist eating disorders unit, assuming you can find one, find a bed in one, which these days is very difficult. Um, or should you be referring to a medical unit? Um, and um, there are certain things that um, so, uh, we distinguish between specialist eating disorder units, where the whole unit is an uh, eating disorder, and specially, specialist eating disorder beds, where one bed in a unit which might have other patients with different problems. And that could be a general psychiatric unit with one or two eating disorder beds. They can normally offer nasogastric feeding, um, daily, daily test, uh, blood testing, daily ECGs and frequent nursing observations. Whereas they don't usually offer intravenous infusion, artificial ventilation or cardiac monitoring. So that will give you an idea of what sort of unit you should be looking for, what sort of bed you should be looking for. Um, so this is about, this is table six, which is management of refeeding. Um, so um, this is a, um, um, a way to uh, approach refeeding and here's two examples of what's uh, what's in that. So you first do a risk assessment, um, look at, uh, see whether there are any red ratings and consider the management of each risk factor. You might have to consider employing a one-to-one -one specialist nurse, but do make sure they know about eating disorders. Um, other area of concern might be you're not sure of the diagnosis and there may be non-eating disorder possibilities. Um, such as Crohn's disease or um, diabetes. So you do investigations rapidly to rule out the alternatives, but don't delay nutrition. 
and the alternative diagnosis, such as the diabetes, may be in addition to the eating disorder. So here's the, uh, some ideas about the bi biochemical results. Um, so um, this is what um, happens in refeeding syndrome. You get low potassium, low phosphate, low magnesium, and there are other features which are in this table. So this gives you an idea of the, um, of the features of refeeding syndrome. And some factors associated with the risk of refeeding syndrome, extremely low weight, prolonged low intake, deranged baseline electrolytes, low white cell count. And I would add there, um, I mean, this is only part of a table, but I would, I would add there sepsis, such as um, pneumonia or any other form of uh, sepsis. It gives you a higher risk of refeeding syndrome. And this we've given, I won't give in detail, but uh, we've given a refeeding protocol where um, we um, divide people into low or medium refeeding syndrome risk and high refeeding syndrome risk. And the high refeeding syndrome risk has a more conservative um, approach to refeeding. But um, we do um, emphasize that even though you may start with low calories, you should increase the calories um, rapidly um, uh, while, while you're testing for refeeding syndrome. And if it happens, then you do, may have to increase, decrease a little bit. Um, but um, don't leave somebody without any nutrition for days and days because you're worried about them getting refeeding syndrome. It's a, that's a potentially fatal uh, um, way to treat somebody. And vitamins is another, another area which are tricky. Um, we tend, tend to give them rather than not give them because people with eating disorders um, such as anorexia nervosa, but also um, uh, ARFID, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, um, and also bulimia nervosa tend to be um, uh, deficient in, in various um, um, uh, vitamins. So we tend to give um, uh, a multivitamin tablet, um, but particularly um, interested in uh, replacing thiamine, because if you don't replace thiamine and then you start refeeding, you can trigger what's called um, Wernicke's encephalopathy, which is a potentially fatal condition due to thiamine deficiency, and it's something you really want to avoid. Okay, what about the families? We've got a table giving some do's and don'ts for families and carers. For example, do get your own support, do ask to be involved in treatment, but don't talk about diet, weight and shape with the person with the eating disorder. There, there's some examples there. There's, there's quite a few. Have a look at this table, table 10. And then how to help, um, written for carers, but also relevant to staff. So be, th be sympathetic to the person with the eating disorder, who is after all experiencing terrifying bullying thoughts and should not be blamed. This is really important because often we find our patients are um, stigmatized by staff um, who uh, admit them um, to uh, general, but also actually to psychiatric units. It, it's pervasive. Um, so it's the, it's the stigma associated with mental disorder um, which is uh, unfortunately shared by uh, people with medical degrees and nursing, de nursing degrees and um, qualifications. Um, so lastly, compulsory treatment. Um, we've got a decision tree for, for compulsory treatment about when to consider it and what to do and when you can't, what you can and can't do to people. So that's, we hope, will be, will be useful. So in turn, la lastly, this project has been running since 2010, it's now 14 years, and tragically patients are still dying needlessly, although, as was pointed out to me recently, almost certainly um, a large number of patients have, been, have not died and, and have done well uh, because um, many people have um, taken note of the guidelines. So I'm, I've got the Churchillian um, uh, quote here, this, this is not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Um, and I'm hoping our app will, uh, will provide some um, 
acceleration of this process. So I've given you the address again, marzipan and mead request at justquill.ac.uk. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening.